Welcome, everybody. My name is Elizabeth McIntyre. I'm the co-director of Screencraft Works, along with Rebecca Del Tufo. Our supporters are Genelec, who support our talks, and Brunel University London, who support our mentoring scheme. A big thank you. I am thrilled to be introducing this evening's speakers and welcoming the audience to this event. Hello, my name is Peter Albrechtson. I'm a sound designer um, for both fiction films and documentaries. I'm based in Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, and I'm a white male, 46 years. I just realized the other day that it, it was 25 years ago since I got into the Danish film school in 97. Um, at the Danish film school, there's both a focus on um, documentaries and fiction films, and as a sound person, you're both getting educated as a production sound mixer and as a sound designer. So that learns you a lot of valuable lessons for like later collaborations. Since 2001, I worked on like a lot of different movies. I've been very privileged to work on a lot of films with directors who are really into sound and really want to explore what sound can do and um, i'm really into the collaborative aspect of filmmaking which is what we'll be talking about today i am roberta bononi i'm a film editor i am italian and i am a white woman with glasses and ginger hair and shaved sides and i started my career in italy I didn't always want to work in film. I started uni wanting to be a journalist and during university, I just kind of shifted my interests a more uh, visual, I guess, uh, discipline. Um, so after uni, I managed to get into this uh, edit school, like, like a course, like a year long edit class. And so I worked in Italy for a couple of years and then to London. And I've been working on a whole variety of features uh, animation, short films, documentary. My name's Sean Nack. I'm a film production student at Brunel University. I'm in my third year right now. Um, I'm a brown guy with black hair, straight black hair and glasses. I only got into learning how to make films, just not bef uh, even before uni. I think it was just a year before uni when I, I, I always liked films, but I just you know, once I started reading about it and learning more about it, I just, I felt like I have this passion to make films and just learn more. And I came to UK from India, where I was living for 18 years before that. And that's pr pretty much about me, not much, not a long history yet. <laughs> it's ready, ready to be written. Since I just only started, um, and I was pretty well shocked to see that sometimes the well, most times the editor doesn't have the the sound uh the the sound of the film except for what's what the camera records and whatever they got on set but the sound effects and things like that and even music uh i thought how, how does the process go exactly when you when you want to edit to the sound say you've got some, a piece of music or even an effect, you sometimes cut to the effect or something like that. How do you edit before uh, you, you have the sound? For, for me, uh, literally mm -hmm. what I do is I look for temp sound effects on mm -hmm. like free sound and kind of library. I, I, I also, from my previous projects, collected a lot of libraries, uh, but Ooh. not so much the original sound from other projects, because I don't mm -hmm. really get that so much in terms of singular. Yeah sound bites so i have i kind of like, every time i'm on a project i kind of steal their sound library <laughs> and yeah. keep it to myself in a big drive it's all very much offline what i do except for um sound the sound recorded from set. i'm more and more involved in mid stage and pre-production then more and more we try to do some sound sketches for the film before it this it they shoot the film and that can be really helpful just to kind of find out okay so what is 
what is the feel of the film? Because often when you read the script, it's so much like it's words and dialogue and it's kind of, it can sometimes be hard to kind of like imagine what is the actual feel of this? How, how should it look and how should it sound? So um, we are trying to do these sketches and that often then inspires the script writer also to write in a certain way and so on. And, and whenever we do those things, we, we invite also like, I remember last time I did it, like I had the production designer and the DOP in here in the in my studio to watch this and kind of suddenly like get new ideas. And it's that's a very creative process. Um I feel sometimes in the post um that um on especially on European films, it can sometimes the picture so there's not the budget for the picture, it's to be part of the post sound which is such a shame i would like to be more involved in the post-production actually mm -hmm. uh, sound and all that but it's not always possible unfortunately hey alex yeah what do you call a pile of kittens what a mountain mountain live my life You working? Yeah. This early? Yeah, Dad. Stop digging. I think we're doing the right thing. David, I love you. You love me. We're trying to figure this out. By the time I'm losing her, Dad. Love is a feeling, and feelings, they move in, they move out. Darling, it already Mom's cheating on you. Would you hit me? What's his name? Derek. Doing here now? Yeah, it's so late. I know I didn't get to say bye, so I just want to come by and say good night, and I love you. I only agreed to do this because you promised me that we were going to work through this. You need a fight. You need to fight for us. David, can you look at me? This is my family. They're worth it. collaboration with director Robert Machoyan. He is someone who's really open for exploring sound and editing together. He edited this film himself. It uh, has a very kind of subjective approach to sound. And it was something that really also came up during the collaboration between picture editing and sound editing. Uh, the idea was all the time to not use music, but use sound as a way of kind of getting into David, the main character's head. So I made this sketch of like abstract car sounds, which I sent to him. One day went by, I didn't hear anything. Two days, three days. I mean, after three days, I was thinking, okay, he's going to fire me. He thinks I'm way too crazy. And like, this is, this is too far out. And then after four days, he wrote me back and said, I love these sounds. Um, now I put them all over the film. And then he sent me the full film and he kind of have, had added these sounds to, I think, like around eight sequences in the film. And he had re-edited after having heard that sound. So he built the whole soundtrack up. So there was this really great creative interplay. I tried to make a sound that was his inner sound. So that's something that I really like to explore now. Like instead of always having the sound be the like the sound of the environment or the sound of the surroundings, then I I often like to kind of try to find an inner sound for the character. And this was very much his kind of inner sound, this 
abstract car sound. It's quite a famous thing that a lot of directors don't care about sound. Um, it, is that still very true? The later, the newer generations of directors are generally really much into sound, I must say. I feel that generally there's a big interest in exploring sound. Back in the old days, it we didn't have quite maybe the access to sound and music that we do now. And I feel that a lot of younger directors are so accustomed to kind of listening to music all the time, hearing podcasts, hearing like using a lot of like the the ears all the time. And um, I feel that generally there's there's a big interest in actually exploring what sound can do. So I feel that that has changed quite a lot. For Robert, I mean, they shot the whole film in this very small town in the US. And I actually asked him to take a bring a small Zoom recorder with them and record sounds out there because I thought it would be amazing to actually hear how that place sounded. So there's some of those recordings actually in the film as part of the ambiences in the film. So like as a sound person, it can be a great thing to try and inspire your director to listen more and like asking them to record sounds can be a great way of kind of also opening up their ears. In university right now, we do this thing, that we make this thing called the sound visual map which is essentially how this this the sound 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 is going to flow and what sounds going to be sort of on the, on top and more noticeable which i'm not sure if you did that with this film or if you still have to do that because if it's just in your head now but it does seem like it's up it applies because especially at the end we sort of flow back to just the leaves after the car is gone, just we only hear the leaves, which is. It's rare nowadays that I really sit down and like make a like a graphic kind of visual mm. kind of picture of how it is. But I think very much about it. I think that generally when we are making movies, there's a tendency towards kind of thinking about the moment that you're working on. Mm -hmm. So like the film will, in the end, it'll turn out to be like hundreds of small moments where you really focus your attention. Mm -hmm. And then you sometimes forget that the film is actually like yeah. it's big and you have to kind of mm -hmm. have an overview of the whole thing. That whole idea about thinking about kind of a sonic dramaturgy, or what did you call it? Like a sonic... Uh, we visual. call it the sound, the visual sound map. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think that's a, such a great idea because it makes you look at the film from like, yeah. from like, you, it gives you an overview yes. of the film. And you like, instead of like thinking about all the small sounds mm -hmm. that are in there, hundreds or thousands of sounds, then yeah. like you, you start like actually watching the film like the audience does. And mm -hmm. I think that is such an important part of the process, but it's a very difficult thing to kind of achieve. So, mm -hmm. I mean, because I feel like, I think, I guess all like who's into filmmaking probably has this feeling that you get so much into the nitty gritty that you kind yeah. of forget the big story. Um, so like doing a visual thing like that, really helps you with that and also actually sometimes having people come in and just see the film together with someone who yeah. doesn't know the film just having someone else in the room I feel kind of changes the way that I watch the film you get to a point when you're just watching it and watching it you're not really watching it anymore you're just seeing it but you know exactly what's happening already and you can't really understand what's wrong with it anymore and that's the point I like the least about my process, but it needs to happen. And usually the secret for that is to walk away, convince the director that we all need a break from it, maybe show it to new people, usually show it to some with someone else in the room is the best cure to that, because suddenly you are really tense about what you're watching and you just start noticing things that you haven't noticed before. That, yeah, there's tricks like that to kind of make you watch and hear your work from a little more distant and mm. kind of getting that kind of overview, which is very important. And yeah, that sound of the leaves at the end of this yeah. is probably one of my favorite sounds in the film. Because it's weird. I heard it, then I, then I looked at the leaves. It was the other way around, not me seeing the, looking at the leaves and then 
because I was looking at the car passing. Then yeah. you, you made me look at the leaves. <laughs> yeah, and that's also because Robert has a picture that has kind of like he says like instead of because a lot of people would just cut after the car leaves because they like the idea would be now there's no more action in this shot mm. but actually by keeping the image yeah. and then having that tiny 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 sound it mm. creates this amazing dynamic which i think like sometimes you tend when you tend to kind of go after the action all the time when you're picture editing and also doing sound, you're kind of thinking, okay, everything has to kind of be full of action. But actually, like, it's often those quiet moments or pauses mm. or breaks, that's when the magic starts happening, I feel. We record so much sound for every film. I'm mostly trying to kind of record fresh sound for every film. Uh, that, that's also one of the great things about being part of the project early because then I have the time to record a lot of sounds. I mean, usually, like if you're a sound designer and get attached to the film at the very late state, then you're usually so busy just kind of making, doing the work. But because I, I'm part of the project already when the script, like on the script stage, then I can use the script almost like a grocery list. And then I have some time to do that in without getting totally stressed out. <laughs> Uh, so that means that there's also time for more fresh material. And then I can give those sounds to the picture editor so that the picture editor has the proper sound effects when he or she is picture editing. The collaboration I had was similar to what you're saying. With uh, We had the composer who did uh, the sound design as well, basically, because because the sound was so particular and so mixed that she wanted to do both at the same time. And because she was uh, um, involved in the project before they shot anything, we were all involved in it very early. We had all these big conversations with the director and the, and the DOP as well. And she collected and like she does a lot of like these weird uh, instruments and like electronic weird sounds. So even like distorted violins and stuff like that, her bedroom is incredible like where she's working. And she jumps on Zoom and she has all these weird things on behind. And she she just like went and recorded a whole bunch of those and sent me like folders and folders with like sounds and things that I could use, even tracks and stuff like that, that I could mix already in the offline. And I just found that incredibly useful and just more fun because you're working on original sounds already. Because I personally find that going to look on free sound is the most boring thing, in a way, to look for sounds that, you know, they're not going to be used somewhat. Surprise! <laughs> is that who I think it is? I've got to go. Happy birthday, sis. I think everybody should do that and involve sound. I mean, just as much mm -hmm. as they should involve the editor at script stage. It was your farewell party, wasn't it? You want a drink? That shit. It hit me bad, you know. I'm not used to being treated like that. <laughs> She's the only person ever that's done something like that to me. And after all those sighs that she gave me, they just like to f*** with us, innit?
this is from uh, my second year <clears throat> assignment. Um, I started off with writing and directing it, but I ended up editing and doing the sound design on it. I wanted uh, a, a sequence in my film where I could sort of try new things. And I was going for a slower paced scene, but uh, we couldn't get a sound, re a sound recorder on the, on the day and ended up getting no sound for the scene at all. Before we uh, we feel short on that day, I decided that okay, we'll just go for for music, and we'll just use music and sort of do it like that. And doing both editing and sound on the film sort of gave me the sole experience of uh, now I know more or less what can be done uh, in in post and just the whole process myself. So. It'll just help me in the future. And the thing I missed out on was the collaboration, which you guys have been talking about, because I just think that brings so much more to the film and all, all the different perspectives and the different voices. You sort of need that in your film. And um, it, that's what makes the film better, because there's more opinions than just one person's. And I think it was a great experience since it was my first film. I sort of got to know what how to do both of these things. It's a very intense sequence. I like that that it is abstract in a way because it's also it's kind of, it's the kind of sequence which would be hard to see if it's if it was very rough and naturalistic. For me, like this whole feeling about the environment, maybe like the what sometimes happens with music and sound, like if if it's when music is playing a lot, then it creates this kind of very like abstract reality almost, mm -hmm. which is which gives the sequence a very special feeling. I would love to like hear, hear a version of this with some sounds added to kind of yeah. see, okay, so would that be more brutal or more poetic? Or mm -hmm. it's um it's interesting how these these creative processes go because it's kind of like also sometimes you like you're talking about not having a sound from the set and that kind of almost opened up the sequence for you. Mm -hmm. And I like that idea of using something that happened by coincidence or mistake and use that in a very creative way. I actually think that that's one of the secrets of like filmmaking is that yeah. like there's always gonna like <laughs> happen something that is unpredictable and yeah, then thanks. use that as creatively as possible. That's really, for me, like one of the important things. I mean, because, mm -hmm. I mean, no matter, I can like I can say that no matter how many years you worked in this business, you'll there'll be there'll always be like something that is unpredictable or like a, something mm -hmm. that is in a way a mistake. But then really use that creatively. That I love that energy. Yeah, every project has issues. Like yeah. there is never a project that goes like smoothly the mm -hmm. whole way from beginning to end. So yeah, happy accidents are good accidents. <laughs> Basically you've edited like you would have edited animation in terms of sound. <laughs> in terms of editing, I think for my personal taste and what I would personally always try to do is use less effects mm -hmm. as possible yeah. uh, as a first go. So. What I see in your clip that I would have done differently, it would have been to not use that fading uh, effect on his face, oh. like him going like that, mm -hmm. and the the strong sort of color filter that you yeah. have on that. I would have tried to be more subtle about it, maybe as a mm -hmm. tip, like because I always feel like when you put too much effect on it, it, it yeah. Sometimes you do it as a choice, but sometimes it could look like you had no choice and you're just doing it to save yourself. Mm -hmm. So I tried to do as less as possible of that as I possibly could. And I think this could have worked even without that strong stuff. Yeah. Because I think with sound and with, the, you know, like just kind of hard, like with a camera being handheld and stuff like that, you probably mm -hmm. would have achieved the same result without the need of that. I got used to it in some way, which is why you need two people because you get used to even while doing sound. If there's a if there's a noise, 
and you you just get used to it and now it seems normal to you but when someone else watches it it's yeah, yeah. but uh thank you so much uh you always need new, think, new yeah. eyes at one point mm -hmm. and ears how i work with sound with animation is such a different process the piece is uh, jackson um and it's a very particular take on how to deal with grief um so from the eyes of a teenage girl so even if you could get the strength to pull yourself out of the door you wouldn't because you wouldn't know there was anything to leave for it would all be gone from your head as soon as you stepped inside. You just forget. And that heavy feeling in your head would push you to the floor and you'd lie down and sink under it and nothing in your body would work and you'd be stuck there. Trying to scream while your insides leaked out of you. Normally in animation, I worked on two TV shows now, animation ones, and there is no sound absolutely at all, obviously, because, you know, they're not real. So, so you were just like the sound work that you have to do in the offline is way harder if you want, because you have to just like collect sounds that, you know, they'll throw away. <laughs> so it's uh, obviously not a waste of time because it helps you giving all the rhythm and, you know, because when you're editing animation, you're going backwards. So you edit the animatic, which is a, just a bunch of JPEGs, uh, and then they go and shoot it. So to make those JPEGs a bit more alive, sound is what helps you. So, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of building up of that to then give it to the post people and they just recreate the sound from complete scratch, which is insane how then you go and watch an episode and it just suddenly is alive. It, it's the, the, the understanding that you get from working in sound and animation is, is ridiculous how you understand the difference that it makes having proper sound down to a film. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be helpful for any director to do <laughs> once in their life. I, I barely know anything about it, really, and how you sort of edited with the live action footage and what came first and how much it came from the script and from the director. And... We basically cut the live action knowing that there would be a gap there for a bit of animation. Yeah. Uh, and just her face coming in like she does. Mm -hmm. So we edited her, uh, her, her monologue basically and left the big gap uh, for, uh, and gave that to the animator and he kind of went and did his own thing, obviously dealing with the, the director. So in this particular scenario, I did not edit an animatic mm -hmm. for it. He just kind of went for it and, and got creative himself and did it but in in the other animation that you would do normally um the process is that you know the storyboard artist will draw as many jpegs as you can possibly draw so you know you get the frames of like movement the editing process becomes more about the rhythm rather than you know choosing a tape or another because obviously it's right. back in terms of what you get mm. um so you just choose the timing of each action and of each movement and how long this action takes and blah blah yeah. um and then that goes to the animation studio and they start animating shot by shot so instead of having jpeg to jpeg that becomes a mm -hmm. shot and uh, there are different you know there's layout first and then they animate the characters like they put the cameras first it's like the proper shoot mm -hmm. they choose where the camera goes and how it moves and then the characters get animated with, you know, expressions and movement of the hands and that. And then after that, they fill up with all the textures and the skies and, you know, the floor and all that stuff. It must have been really interesting, the old process. Yeah, it's really interesting because it's a big change from live action because it's really backwards. Like, you don't get a choice of takes, which is what I suffer most with, which is why I'm more like, I tend to like live action mm. more than animation. Um, I missed real people on screen for <laughs> too long. Do you do some picture edits after the sound, like after the sound process has begun? Like I'm thinking that the when there's a lot of sound coming in, it must change the feel of the rhythm and tempo and of the pictures. Um, 
I wouldn't say so what I have done in both the shows is I send the animatic to the sound designers straight away as soon as the animatic is locked they get it basically the 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 animatic lock is very very close to how it's going to be because like every time you have to change a cut it's a whole you have to move the whole animation studio at that point um so usually what happens is that you can cut it down but you can't make it longer <laughs> so like yeah my secret was to like add some cross dissolves here and there so i had the handles to then trim it um but so the the, the sound people the sound department would get the animatic and have kind of a rough pass on it already and so I could use that, but still kind of chop it here and there because the edit, you know, then would change. I don't think it changes that much for sound, but I think them seeing the animatic, they will be able to tell me, you know, that line starts too soon because this explosion needs to last longer mm -hmm. and whatever. Like, so we did have some of those conversations, definitely. But I wouldn't say that it's that often. Usually they kind of make it fit rather than the other way around. Over two years, Amy. It's okay, Amy. I don't want him to control where I run. <laughs> sound process with Relive was really a lot. <laughs> so there was a lot of slow motion and she's a runner and that's how she, that's when she gets assaulted. So um, the whole film is about her running basically. So all the running clips were slow motion, but the director really wanted for it to be in sync. There's a whole thing about her in the nightmare and her punching, because punching the pillow is apparently a way of getting rid of the anxiety. And so all that, like I had my assistant at, on this project, the poor thing, to create, to speed up all the clips and sync all the clips to the sound, to the real sound uh, that was recorded on set. And that was just a massive job. <laughs> and because it's so sound based, we did a bit of, uh, this is the project where I had more back and forth with the composer, because we wanted the, the music and the sound design to kind of be quite you know part two of each other i am really happy on how it turned out because i the sound designer did an amazing job with it and like sinking the punches and the them becoming steps and the breathing is just like she's done an amazing amazing work on it so i'm very it's proud very powerful it. yeah how how like can you talk a little bit more about the process of actually you and the sound designer how you, you kind of collaborated more kind of like in a little more detail I, I really love the interplay between the sounds and the and the picture and the whole rhythm of the of the thing yeah so well I obviously on that piece tried to pull everything like obviously I've cut it to a rhythm like the 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 sound the recorded sound from her real steps and breathing together with the breathing of uh, her in the nightmare so while she's waking up from her sleep uh, and together there's also him uh, kind of growling underneath mm. and just like breathe, heavy breathing. So we tried already in the edit to be really rhythmic about it, literally all those fast cuts with the hands and the steps and her face and, and her, her hands running. Um, we really cut that to a rhythm and mm basically then the, communicate like communicated that to the sound designer as well um where she i, I hope she had her life a bit easier on that because i feel like we have done a lot of work in the in the offline uh with the sound trying to make it fit as much as we possibly could mm -hmm. um 
so yeah the most back and forth in that i think was with the composer um because like just having those drones laid in where it needed and where it needed to cut off um and so he went and composed at like a first bed and then he came back to us so we could kind of make it fit and then we sent it back to him so he could change it accordingly um so that was mostly the back and forth um but yeah the sound designer actually just made it just all more powerful because i think she 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 just took it to the next level in terms of syncing a film i did recently called the territory which is a documentary uh, produced by national geographic O sonho brasileiro de quem está vivendo aqui é ter seu pedacinho de terra para poder trabalhar, né? tirar ali o seu sustento. Produzindo alguma coisa, plantando para fazer nosso Brasil para frente. Eu mesmo falo, eu nunca vi nada de índio. Fala, ninguém nunca viu, não. É, só fala, tá? E o que eu fico revoltado é que a gente ainda é considerado bandido, pessoas que, que atrapalham o país, entendeu? A Associação dos Bonitos diz que querem sua terra. Mas, no meu ponto de vista, eu acho que eles querem mais do que a terra. Eles querem acabar com o povo indígena, acabar com os isolados. A gente não vai permitir que aconteça, não. I always find openings of movies very important, like the the way that you set the tone and how you kind of catch the audience in a way. But it's also interesting in the sense that often when you kind of make uh, open a film, there's quite often music playing. And we decided to not go with music, but used the sounds instead to really give you this feeling of like intense impact but also to build the whole environment the film takes place in the amazon jungle um and it's both about like the um the people who live there but also the the people who are trying to kind of cut down the forest and so on so it it it's a quite nuanced i think uh description of like the whole situation down there which is like right now very timely with the presidential election going on um but uh, from a collaborative aspect i really liked how we tried to work with picture editing and sound editing together so that you really get this um rhythm of the sounds that influence the pictures that then come back and so we actually did some back and forth between picture and sound to create the dynamics that's in this opening so the idea was very much to like uh, use the dynamics of sound to make that as musical as possible so you go in these you have these very strong environmental sounds 
uh, for every, like you start out in the car, you go into the jungle. It's kind of like everything has very defined uh, intense sounds. So we want to kind of create that intensity just from um, this feeling of being very close to something that when you hear all these small sounds and the chainsaw and so on, then you get this kind of feeling of that you're there. So it's a very, um, in that sense, a very kind of musical approach to using sound and using editing. Um, and I and I really feel like the the way that this mm -hmm. came together was really because there was very much an openness from the picture editing for like for having these kind of like very mm -hmm. uh, this very intense soundscape you said that you went back and forth uh with the picture editor because i i know that that's always a bit of a tricky process to go back and forth i've had that in the not that long ago in a project and it's just very tough you know for just like the syncing process and all that like was that hard to how was that collaboration going? Um, it's it, it can be hard for sure. We um, were trying to be very, very, very organized and trying to like also make sure that that the files that we send like that they work together. And when we got a new export from the the editing that it worked with like conforming our sessions that is really the difficult very difficult sometimes very difficult part of like collaborating very closely uh, between edit and sound but i feel that if you're i mean if if you do some tests before you get to that like you have to kind of check how i feel that every project sometimes have its own kind of like problems and issues and um and so i can really recommend like really doing some testing before you start on actual sending all these big files back and forth but yeah it can be tricky but we i mean mostly on this film it worked out very well i mean sometimes it took some extra conforming time but for something like this it was it was it wasn't that complicated as far as getting the sound goes and the, the foley and all of that uh how much of it was recorded recorded on location and did you create foley yeah there was a lot of creation of sounds i did the sound design together with uh, one clausen and we met with the director here in copenhagen uh, he's actually based in new york but he came over together with the composer while they were still editing actually and we had the a first meeting there where we did some key sequences in the film which we did sound design for and that was so great because it meant that I mean even though yeah there was a lot of like some conforming afterwards because they went back then and re-edited it was still a way to kind of find out for them like okay so we we can actually use the uh, use sound in a very creative way and um uh, yeah, so so they had a sketch of that sequence, then we did the sound for it, then they went back and re-edited, and then we refined that and mixed it. Um, so again, it was like going back and forth, which was really helpful. The co composer actually went to the Amazon and recorded lots and lots of ambiences. Uh, she used that in her music. Uh, as part of the music and like she sampled different sounds and animals from down there to use that in the music and then I also got those sounds and um, we used that as part of the sound design and the environment so there's actually a lot of sounds that are both in the music and in the sound design and then on top of that we had a Foley artist to help out with doing like some specific sounds mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, there's a lot of layers in there, but I mean, the core elements of it is really like recorded in the Amazon and then um, doing a lot of different kind of tweaks of, around it. This is why I really liked talking earlier with the director, because it means that when I get to the sound editing, then I know more about the vibe they're looking for. I feel that sometimes if I come, I mean, it's very rare nowadays, but if I get into a project very late, then it's also a bit 
more difficult to kind of find the style that the director maybe is looking for. Um, I really like the being there early because then you can try out mm -hmm. things and there's more time to experiment. I mean, um, uh, sometimes kind of the the it, the scenes kind of show themselves like if they should be humorous or funny or like if scary or depressive. Um, <laughs> but but I think that like. This is where it's very important to have a great communication with the director. And I like when the director is not uh, directing you in a way where it's like, okay, you put in a dog there and then a car pass and then this flagpole in the background that should sound exactly like my mother's flagpole from when I was five years old or something like that. I, I much prefer when it's much more like setting a vibe or an atmosphere and saying okay so this is a scene where our main character is going through a really like emotional time and kind of tr trying to find his way out through this chaos or like kind of and then maybe talking about the emotional beats of the scene i try to go through the script together with the director before going on the shoot and then also talk with the production sound mixer about like how things to be aware of like there's often some specific scenes that have like some kind of noisy like environment or whatever that could be or maybe there's scenes with a lot of actors in it or like it could be so many things so i mean i have several talks with the director and then usually have like one or two talks with the production sound mixer and then the production sound mixer goes on the set and records and then i uh, get dailies every day so that i get a link for the dailies just like the picture editor does and like mm -hmm. like a lot of other people on the crew so i get to also hear what's being uh, recorded out there and um, when you're in the script phase then you imagine a lot of things and you try to come up with ideas and mm -hmm. some of those ideas will make it through the shoot but there'll also be a lot of ideas that will never make it through the shoot that will change and that's a part of the process that you have to be open for things changing around you can i mean even the craziest imagination cannot think of like all the issues that will happen during a show yeah. <laughs> during a post and so you try to imagine a lot of things and some of it turns out the kind of the way you imagine and a lot of things don't mm -hmm. i like when when directors direct the the direct you more like a, if more like an actor i guess in a way like where you're talking about the emotions of the scene i feel that sometimes if it gets very very kind of like you have to do that and have to do that and have to do that it feels almost like 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 uh, your hands are tied in a way yeah you get very different directors like the ones who understand they will give you the in in visual editing is the same you know is the difference between the director saying can we add five frames to that shot mm -hmm. and the director saying i think this feels slow yeah. off you go and do your thing <laughs> like you know yeah. So it's like, it's, it's a matter of trust as well. I think that, you know, you build up and I feel like often is younger directors that are more like to the detail and the more you, the more they're experienced, the more they trust themselves and the more they trust the people they choose to collaborate with. Some editors is more instinctive for some others is more brainy process. I think for me, it's just like. I see a shot, I like it, I put it in the timeline and I work like that, like quite organically. But yeah, some other editors would say differently and they just like to watch all the rushes at once before they take notes on paper and then they go back to their notes and choose that, you know, and, and go accordingly. I don't like to do that, but that's very personal way of working, really. Some editors like their paper, <laughs> basically. I don't at all i will read the script put it in a drawer leave it there forever pretty much and just pull it out just if something goes wrong same with the script supervising notes and all that stuff um if everything goes well i will not see paper again <laughs> basically and i'd rather get the footage to drive me 
because that's what I have in the end. So there's no point in doing a zillion paper edits and then you don't get the rushes you need for that. So what's the point? I let my instinct drive a lot of the times and it often happened that my rough cut as like out of my guts gets all changed and chain da 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 and and then they asked me to go back to the way it was. Yeah, I also have a more intuitive approach. What I sometimes experience with the script is more like if like if we want to check for ADR lines or a dialogue that needs to be fixed or things like that, uh, then you sometimes go back to the script and try and find out okay, so what is happening here and how many lines uh, should be set and so on. But um, mostly I find that my own creative process happen. I mean, it's very rare that I look at the script when I'm in the post kind of, I actually feel that one of the advantages for me not being on the set is that I don't know how hard it's been to shoot the film. Yeah. I have no idea of like, yeah. how does the room look like in mm -hmm. real life? I have no idea how much time they spend on the makeup for the main character or like I have no idea of like how much time they spend to dress the set or whatever. Um, I'm only looking at the film as a film and trying to kind of make the image speak to me and come alive in the best mm -hmm. possible way. And I like that I'm not tied into anything that has to do with like the what is what was difficult or hard on set um and um and and like usually i only find out about that if like the director is telling me some kind of anecdote from yeah. like some <laughs> issues that they had otherwise i i mean uh, i mean sometimes you kind of get very specific requests i did a movie uh, a year ago where like all the um what you called it all the ice cubes and the drinks were fake because they you i mean it was plastic so that they like so that mm -hmm. they didn't melt and they could use that of course and i mean that's an old production design trick but like then the director just kept on saying remember to do the foley for the ice cube remember <laughs> to do the foley for the ice cube and you get these kind of specific requests where you're like okay so what kind of issue did you have on the set like okay so the <laughs> i guess there's like something very special that you but really and i i mean i i i never thought of the ice cubes as being something a problem and any and in any way for my future projects um I will a hundred percent sort of bring everyone together since because it's just it will be a student film um and people sort of still have the time to do that and sort of speak to each other so my cinematographer will be speaking to the sound designer and they sort of exchange ideas just a, a group brainstorming session more or less where anyone can sort of chip in uh and I, I think that just increases the chemistry and sort of brings everyone to, on the same page, which is very, uh, I think it's super important on any production that they have a personal stake in the uh, in the project. A huge thank you to our speakers, uh, to Peter, to Roberta and to Shornak for um, such a fascinating talk. I think particularly also what, what has struck me is just the, the range of um, stages of experience, um, as well as the disciplines, as well as the um, perceptions and insights from different countries as well. Uh, so it's just been such a rich and interesting talk. Thank you very much for everybody to come, even though I can't see them. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Peter and Shonak. <laughs>